It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Mike Pompeo was confirmed by the U.S. Senate to become the next director of the Central Intelligence Agency on Monday. Pompeo is a member of the Tea Party and achieved national fame through his involvement in the Benghazi hearing. Michael Flynn was also sworn in as Trump's new national security advisor. Flynn is a former U.S. Army Lieutenant General and, like Pompeo, is strongly opposed to the Iran nuclear deal. James Comey was also stayed as the FBI director. So joining us now to discuss these developments are Melvin Goodman and Colleen Rowley. Melvin Goodman is an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University and author of Whistleblower at the CIA, Inside Account of the Politics of Intelligence. Thanks for joining us, Melvin. Thank you, Sharmini. Good to be with you. And Colleen Rowley is former FBI agent and legal counsel for the FBI. She's renowned for being a whistleblower for her testimonies in two con congressional committees on failures of the FBI regarding 9-11. Colleen, good to have you back. Yes, thanks for having me. So Melvin, let's begin with you since you're new to us at the Real News. Uh, you've worked as an analyst for the CIA. Give us your reaction to the confirmation of Mike Pompeo to lead the CIA. Well, I think it's a terrible choice. Uh, and you have to look at the fact that in the history of the CIA, there have been two directors from the Congress, one Representative Porter Goss from Florida, and the other George Tenet, who was the staff director of the Intelligence Committee for uh, more than 10 years. Both of them tried to politicize intelligence uh, when they were at the CIA as directors. And of course, the infamous experience of George Tenet, who told President George Bush that it would be a slam dunk to give him the intelligence that the White House needed to go to the American people to justify the war against Iraq. Uh, Porter Goss tried to do the same thing uh, in terms of politicizing intelligence, and he even made it widely known in terms of uh, memos uh, to all of the analysts at the building in his short tenure. He didn't last more than a year and a half. Uh, Papeo, I think, is a terrible choice and a risk to politicize intelligence because he's taken very hardline positions that are opposed to the consensus within the intelligence community. A very good example is his opposition to the Iran nuclear accord. Uh, the CIA was a very important part of the negotiation of that accord. They're an important part of negotiating any arms control agreement. The CIA is primarily responsible for the verification and monitoring uh, of any arms control agreement. And that was true in the case of the nuclear agreement uh, with Iran. And they even drew private praise, too bad it wasn't public, from Secretary of State John Kerry for the important work that they did. Uh, the outgoing CIA Director John Brennan uh, has publicly supported the Iran nuclear accord and taking a very strong position against uh, most of the appointments of the uh, Trump team that are opposed to the nuclear accord. And when you look at Pompeo, he, he would like to bring back massive surveillance. He's talked about bringing back torture and abuse, specifically waterboarding. He's called for the death penalty for Edward Snowden. Uh, he didn't even accept the Republican Benghazi report and issued his own minority report that one other congressman, another Tea Party member uh, signed. He's a very authoritarian type in terms of uh, temperament, uh, very pugnacious. And I think there's going to be tremendous difficulty for the analysts uh, at the CIA with Pompeo. And uh, Colleen, let me get your reaction to Pompeo as well. And then, of course, of, uh, you know, Comey continuing as the FBI uh, director. Well, I would just add to the description of Pompeo that he was a um, West Point, I think he was maybe even first in his class as Petraeus was. And uh, we have a we have an issue now where we have the military taking over civilian control because uh, Trump has named three or four of these people as generals and someone like Pompeo who didn't rise up to be a general still has that militaristic background. I suppose it's just natural since we're in 14 years of what they call perpetual war that we would have pretty much all of the government high-level positions now being taken over by military. But I think uh, that's one of the issues. And, you know, the other thing is uh, Panetta uh, was also a, a senator, and everyone had high hopes for him. 
<coughs> taking over the CIA, but he fell into that same thing. He even leaked information to the producer of Zero Dark Thirty uh, to produce the um, to produce the film that showed that torture worked. Um, so you know, there's it's really a sad, sad situation with Pompeo with with Comey. Um, you know, he's this is a guy who is also a consummate, you know, political insider in Washington D.C. establishment. He has uh, skated between the two parties, um, actually to the point where he had the Democrats liking him for dis for uh, ending the investigation of Hillary Clinton, and then turning around and hating him for reopening it. And the same thing with the Trump administration; they they criticized him, called him names for closing the investigation. And then turned around and, you know, now have said he should stay on uh, after he, 10 days before the election, reopened the investigation. So, I mean, this is highly unusual for a uh, uh, political or for a FBI director to have, and I think in some ways, maybe that's the D.C. Is, uh, situation right now. Maybe you have to be a George Tenet or a Comey to even be able to exist because of the rancor and the partisanship that has gotten to this level. It's, it's like, I don't know. Comey also now finds himself in a weakened position. Um, you might even say he's damaged goods. Uh, a little bit like Robert Mueller and George Tenet were after 9-11 because both of them knew really some, some really sad truth about the lack of sharing of information that 9-11 could have been prevented. Of course, the Bush administration knew that as well. They were threatening to split the FBI. So it put uh, the Robert Mueller, the, the then FBI director, in this weakened position. Right now, uh, the, you know, Comey, James Comey, is under investigation by the Inspector General of the Department of Justice for having uh, made this unusual announcement 10 days before the election. And, you know, so you have this leverage situation going on, at, and I think that that also creates a, a lot of uh, other issues and problems. You know, it's, it's Machia a student of Machiavelli would have a tough time figuring out what's going on right now. And Colleen, also Comey has uh, been, I guess, uh, in terms of his reappointment, uh, many people are questioning it uh, because of uh, the fact that he's uh, actually investigating a number of uh, Trump uh, associates and uh, friends, and uh, whether this could, uh, now this reappointment could actually affect those investigations. What do you make of that? Well, you know, it's not so much a reappointment. He's just allowed to stay on. His appointment was for 10 years. And Robert Mueller, his predecessor, and, and by the way, very much like James Comey, these two guys are cut from the same cloth. Uh, they let Robert Mueller stay for 12 years. Uh, and so I think that uh, from Trump's standpoint, um, it's better not to have another, another uh, uh, acrimonious hearing where these same issues that you just brought up would be brought up Congress would be asking James Comey, how is he investigating uh, Trump campaign's connections to, to Russia? So I, I think that you can see that how this is, you know, a good move maybe for, I wasn't surprised, put it that way. I was not surprised that Trump kept James Comey on. And, uh, and of course, uh, we'll have to see what happens with these investigations. That it's unfortunate that we have the hierarchies that do exist in the agencies I think I think that people should be much more professional and do the job and not be overseen to the extent that they are from the political end in politicizing the investigation or politicizing intelligence. And of course, that's a completely separate problem that we just saw play out in the lead up to the election. Right. And uh, Melvin, let me get your take on the fact that Obama prosecuted more than uh, a, a lot more whistleblowers than any other previous administration. Um, what do you think will happen under Pompeo, who's already called for the execution of Edward Snowden? Well, I think there was a dark side to the Obama legacy. Uh, he used the Espionage Act uh, more than all of the presidents since it was signed during World War I in 1917. He was very aggressive on uh, leaks, even more aggressive than the George W. Bush administration. And I think uh, his uh, very uh, late commutation of Chelsea Manning's sentence, which uh, I fully supported, of course, was in part to try to correct that record or balance that record because he came into office at campaign in 2007, 2008, 
as someone who thought you can't uh, sacrifice liberty in the name of security, and he recognized the uppermost importance of liberty, he said he would have a transparent uh, administration, and we didn't see uh, any of that. Uh, and the fact that he didn't look for accountability for the terrible crimes that were committed by the CIA during the war on terror, particularly the torture and abuse, the extraordinary renditions, the secret prisons. He said, I don't want to look back. I want to look forward. And by not having accountability and this dark side of the legacy means that it's a lot easier for a Donald Trump to resume things that we know are criminal. And Pompeo, no matter what he said in the confirmation hearings, and I don't put a lot into what people say during confirmation hearings because they say what they need to, the fact of the matter is Pompeo fully supports the return to torture and abuse, fully supports the return to waterboarding. We know President Trump is a big fan of waterboarding. Uh, it's not that waterboarding doesn't work. I mean, it doesn't work, but the fact is it's immoral. Uh, we shouldn't even be thinking about it. Uh, doing it. And the way the CIA conducted the whole um, in, uh, technique, interrogation techniques, uh, I think that resembled Nazi Germany to a certain extent. So I, I'm quite concerned about that side of the legacy, and I'm quite concerned that Pompeo will not uh, really use a firm hand at the CIA. And I think once again, and I agree with Colleen here, with Leon Panetta, he was captured by the operational mentality of the CIA soon after he took over as director of the CIA. And I think Pompeo is cut from the same cloth uh, as Pineo. You need strong people at the CIA. And frankly, we haven't had that uh, for at least 30 years. Uh, so this is going to be a continuing problem. And when you add to the fact that the one who is closest to Donald Trump is uh, General Michael Flynn, this is really worrisome. Uh, Flynn was essentially uh, pushed into retirement in 2014 because uh, he could not manage the Defense Intelligence Agency. He was conspiratorial minded. He was uh, dominating in terms of his views. Uh, he didn't look carefully at intelligence. He didn't accept uh, the output from his intelligence analysts. Uh, we see he's a, a very authoritarian and pugnacious personality, like so many of the appointments. And even the one who seems to be the exception to this rule, James Mattis, I'm not in favor of this confirmation that Mattis received. He's only the second general who's received a waiver to take over the Defense Department. But the other one was an incredible example. It happened to be George C. Marshall in 1947, 1948. Uh, no one's going to compare Flynn to George Marshall. Um, so... Having Flynn in that position, which of course didn't require confirmation, is incredibly worrisome. Having Mattis, who was pushed out of command because he wanted to extend the war in, uh, in Iraq to Iran, which is something that the Obama administration was trying to uh, get out of, the spiral of military activity in Southwest Asia and the Middle East that has really uh, done great harm to the American economy and American political standing overseas, all of these things are incredibly worrisome. And again, to uh, support what Colleen said, it's this militarization of the national security team. The foundings wanted civilian control of foreign policy. They wanted civilian control in the Congress and civilian control in terms of appointments to positions of national security importance. We don't have that anymore. The civilians have really been routed uh, by military people who are now at the Department of Homeland Security, at the National Security Council, uh, at the Department of Defense. And frankly, I call Pompeo a military man because of his West Point background and his authoritarian uh, bent. We have him at CIA. And I'm not impressed with the appointment of former Senator Dan Coats from Indiana as the so-called intelligence czar. This is another very uh, weak appointment. So when you look at national security, foreign policy, international relations, you look at the comments that Trump made during the campaign, you look at the steps that he's taken already, uh, the ambassador he appointed to Israel, the uh, talk of moving the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, the fact that Netanyahu has already announced more settlements on the West Bank because he knows he now has a friend in the White House. Um, I, I think we're headed for a very rocky uh, patch and I'm not convinced that uh, democratic opposition is going to be strong enough or tenacious enough or 
cohesive enough uh, to really deal uh, with this Republican mindset, and particularly after Trump's inaugural speech, was a, which was a, a dangerous kind of speech in terms of his references to American carnage and the idea of American first, which of course was the theme of Charles Lindbergh, who was the uh, anti-Semite from the 1930s, uh, who was considered to be a presidential candidate at that time. So there are a lot of things to worry about at this particular uh, juncture. And when you throw in what happened at the CIA on Saturday, that outrageous visit of Donald Trump standing in front of the memorial wall, and no one has pointed this out, but he was also 20 feet from the inscription, the biblical ins inscription in the lobby of the CIA uh, building that I used to pass every time I entered the CIA, the truth will set you free. Well, I, I think the truth and Donald Trump are, are not on very good terms. Uh, and we saw that played out on Saturday in his comments at the CIA. And of course, his uh, press spokesman who had to echo all of his statements at his first press conference on Saturday at the White House. There, so there's a lot to be concerned about. Um, indeed. Uh, the other sort of matter that's floating out there, and many people have asked us to ask through social media from uh, people that have expertise in, in these areas of national security and intelligence is how much influence um, does the deep state have uh, in terms of the uh, new administration and how do you think it'll be interacting uh, with these new appointees? And I'll go to Colleen uh, first and then to you, Melvin. Well, I think this might be where my comment about Machiavelli comes in because, you know, just at the end of the last administration, we did have Brennan and Clapper and, and uh, mostly it was Brennan and Clapper, but they got the other Comey and uh, the NSA to go along with it. And it looked like it was really a, a deep state uh, uh, effort to, uh, you know, maybe even change the results of the Electoral College. It was pretty incredible. Those leaks, by the way, that would always say anonymous high level officials are saying that there's a FISA that has information on Trump, et cetera, or Trump's campaign. Those, those things are not whistleblowers. Those are green-lighted, authorized leaks coming from the top, and frankly, on highly classified information. So Trump had a right to be a little bit alarmed about the, those deep state efforts at the tail end. The, the leaking of the Steele memo, uh, which seems to me to be a, a real hoax of a thing where the guy didn't even have uh, any connection to, he hadn't been in Russia for 20 years and these looks like double, triple hearsay rumors that he put together for opposition research. And then you had your, your CIA uh, briefing that to uh, report. I don't know if the CIA briefed it to them, but somehow it leaked. So in, in any case, I think this was concerning and it might explain why Trump now has picked some people that he thinks that he would have control over. And again, you can see always this tension, even going back to the books about the Dulles brothers and JFK and, and JFK wanting, and Truman even did this, I think, at a later stage, saying the CIA had too much power. So you're always seeing this tension. And I, I wouldn't really begrudge Trump in a way of wanting to get this a little bit back under control so that he doesn't have the deep state uh, you know, attacking him. Uh, and I think that there were some real issues with, uh, you know, misinformation put out for different reasons for partisan stuff. It's very, George Washington, by the way, warned that anytime you get a foreign country that somehow is interjected into partisan politics inside the United States, and, and that is precisely what occurred here, it's very dangerous. It's, a, it's really a way of disrupting uh, the United States. It's not, it's the overreaction. For instance, if there is hacking going on, which there's hacking going on uh, by all countries, at least who have the capability to do that, and this reaction, this hysterical reaction, is really what I think weakened the United States, and certainly the prestige and the moral superiority that we always claim we have, I think that was weakened. I think even Clapper admitted that at one point. So uh, I think we're in, uh, I totally agree, we are in for a, a real bumpy ride here. I even predicted a constitutional crisis uh, before too long. I think there are some parallels that we're seeing shape up with uh, between Watergate, the, the environment where you had all these different 
individuals, again, with all, you know, DC insider politics playing and their own power plays going on. And um, I think that, you know, the public is going to have to be real careful that they don't uh, accept, uh, you know, news reports, um, like the news reports that occurred, frankly, in, in this re last couple of months, at least be skeptical of those because um, it's dangerous. It's real dangerous stuff for foreign policy, uh, for the, the gullible. And frankly, the Democrats were even more gullible because they wanted to find something to blame the loss of the election on and actually have turned fairly war hawkish and dangerously so. So that's the thing I'm most concerned about. Uh, there's a lot of things to be concerned about, but I think the, the one good thing, if, we, if I want to just balance out uh, <laughs> Mel's Mel's talk a little bit. The one good thing is maybe for business reasons, for all different, you know, could be wrongful reasons, but for, for whatever reason, Trump does seem to be pushing a detente, uh, reducing the tensions with Russia. And that would be the one thing that I think would be important to do. I, I would be all, in, well, you know, we should all be in favor of that because it's very, very dangerous to have war games going on and borders, uh, to be aiming missiles at each other, et cetera. So, um, you know, we can, again, we, we're just going to have to kind of watch and see here. It's just real evolving and it's hard to know. Right. And Melvin, let me give you the last word. What do you think the predictions will be in terms of relations with the new administration, the new appointees and the deep state? Well, I don't have that concern that Colleen has with regard to the deep state. I think it was a problem during the Bush administration because you had a vice president, Dick Cheney, who was trying to manipulate the intelligence community, who manipulated the intelligence uh, to get us into an immoral and illegal war uh, in Iraq. I don't think uh, President Obama has given enough credit for trying to move away uh, from the direction that Cheney put us on. Uh, so my concern is not with the so-called dark state, it's, it's with the Trump administration. It's the inexperience of the Trump administration. It's having a president who has no knowledge of international relations, no knowledge and experience in diplomacy, uh, no curiosity, no willingness to accept intelligence uh, briefings, and probably doesn't even have the context to fully uh, understand or absorb intelligence briefings. It's appointments in the domestic area and the foreign policy area that are threatening uh, to the institutions that we have. Uh, when you look at the Democratic, the domestic appointments, He's appointing people who are designed to blow up the very departments and agencies of government that they're being appointed to. Just look at who's going to the EPA, look who's going to uh, Health and Human Services, uh, look who's going to the Labor Department. And then when you look at the militarization of the national security arena, uh, this is another big problem that we talked about. Now, the one thing I, I do share with uh, Colleen, but I, I'm not confident about it, is there, there must be a return to some kind of dialogue. I'm not saying it has to be detente, but there has to be an institutionalized institutionalization of the dialogue uh, with Russia. And I hear here, I think the Obama administration went too far in terms of cutting off all contacts, uh, not allowing the uh, Pentagon to ha meet with their counterparts at the uh, uh, various Russian counterpart organizations. Uh, the uh, personalization and the demonization of, of Putin uh, with gratuitous personal uh, remarks. Uh, and I think Putin has sent the signal uh, that he wants to get some kind of stability restored to the Russian-American relationship. When you look at the two most important relationships that the United States is going to pursue in the next five to ten years, one is Russia and the other is China. Well, already the Trump administration has mishandled the relationship with China, including the phone call with the president of Taiwan and threatening remarks about islands in the South China Sea, uh, which really has no policy background in front of it or no programmatic thought uh, behind it. And it remains to be seen what can be done with regard to Russia, because he's appointed some people who are willing to move in that direction, such as the Secretary of State Tillerson, uh, when he gets confirmed. But then look at the very Cold War-like statements you get about Russia that come from Mattis, Secretary of Defense, uh, John Flynn, the head of the Department of Homeland Security, and Pompeo, uh, who's very hardline in his views toward Russia. So it's going to, 
uh, remain to be seen if this administration uh, at the very beginning, because it's made up of players who really are inexperienced and don't know each other very well. And at the top of this chain, you have a president who has a lot to learn uh, to put together a sophisticated policy is going to be a lot to ask for. So I'm not confident in that regard either. All right, Melvin Goodman, Colleen Rowley, I thank you both for joining us here at the Real News Network and looking forward to having you back, especially you, Melvin. Um, we've been trying to reach you for a long time uh, to get you on, and you're so close to us. Uh, we are here in Baltimore. I hope to have you uh, in our studio sometime soon. Thank you very much. It was great to be with you, and I look forward to being with you again. All right. Bye for now, Colleen. Bye. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.